you to URL Hangout Lounge today after a very special concert to celebrate Europe Day 2020. We wanted to share hope through music. I hope we managed to do that. Um, I guess most of you will be joining and tuning in right after watching the concert. We hope that you enjoyed it. And we are very much looking forward to an evening filled with interesting conversations and a lot of questions maybe from your side. My name is Lisa, I'm the EUIO's um, Projects and Digital Coordinator and together with Marshall Marcus, our Secretary General, I'll be hosting this session today. We are broadcasting live from our Zoom studio where we've virtually met from all over the world just to talk to you and to talk about how this online concert came together. Let me show you what we've got lined up for today. Don't know about, about you, but I think this is a very impressive list of guests. We have two very well-known conductors joining us. We have four EYO alumni who've all been uh, involved in some kind or another in the production of this concert. And then we have our music animator coming in last. We um, estimate this, that all of these interviews will take about an hour, so about 10 minutes each, but overall we want to keep this very flexible. So please feel free to interact with us through YouTube. So if you have questions or comments, just type them in the um, comment section on YouTube which you can find on the right side, I think. And it will come directly to us and we'll do our best to give you a satisfying answer to your question. Uh, we'll also have some space reserved after all the interviews are done. So um, stick with us if you want to know more. Um, and so without further ado, let's get started with our first guest. Marshall, do you want to take it from here? Thanks very much, Lisa, and welcome everybody who's in listening and watching. Um, hope you enjoyed our concert. Our first guest, uh, who you saw actually conducting a bolero, is the EUIO chief conductor Vasily Petrenko. And I was quite uh, interested, uh, Vasily, watching uh, what you were doing there. I mean, I'm actually just going to try and show a little image of you coming up now. So. This is the view that the players had in Bolero, only it's not the view they had because they were in their houses waiting to record. So they saw you eventually, but of course, when you recorded the track that they all followed, you couldn't see them. So what's it like conducting an absent orchestra? Hello, everyone, first of all. Uh, it is challenging because uh, you imagine the music inside uh, your mind, but obviously you don't hear uh, immediate response. And uh, as you can see in the background, it's of course in the house rather than on the concert stage. And for that to keep the inspiration and to have in your mind how the music will sound requires a lot of imagination and a discipline. It's not an easy process, but uh, I hope I gave quite a good guidance for everyone. It's also the issues which you not notice in the normal life. You should not go left or right with your gesture from the screen because otherwise people don't see you. So you have to be rather economic on the space uh, with your gesticulation and uh, you have to be very clear. I wouldn't say I would love to repeat this experience many more times. I would say I'd prefer the live concerts, but uh, we live in a very interesting time. We live in a very challenging world. I hope that soon the whole humanity will overcome the current crisis with the coronavirus and uh, soon we will be back for the live performances. Nothing can replace them. We're trying to get as close as possible. However, it's not the same. It's not the same for us. It's not the same for you. Indeed. Um, well, look, Vasily, I mean, it's interesting you're talking there about getting back and what we'll be doing. What's your, what is your view about how this is all going to play out? I mean, here you are at home, um, not with all this huge list of international concerts you normally have, but uh, you must be giving a lot of thought to 
when might you get back what will it look like will the concert hall be different will people come back to the concert hall i'm quite sure all the musicians professionals are kind of wondering how all this is going to work what what's your answer about what this what everybody's calling the new normal what's the new normal going to look like and when will it look like that uh, first of all nobody can say exactly how it will look like but i have to say that during the most difficult times in the human history during the world war one world war two and the previous very difficult times uh, the art itself had a very significant role in the society if you will observe this historically all the creativity in the arts and culture during the most difficult periods you can see so many great examples of the people who were giving their art as almost a flag for the for the society to recover from most difficult circumstances you can name it you from the Haydn mass in the time of war to Shostakovich seventh symphony both of them were symbols of its time uh, arts and culture are vital for humans they're vital for the mental health they're vital for the mental recovery they can in many ways they can drive the society forward especially in the most difficult time so this is what i would expect will happen during and after this crisis of course economic time will be really difficult based on the service and based on my own observations uh, people at the moment divided into two territories there's a lot of people who basically locked down in their four walls and who eager to go out and to be back into the concert halls uh, back to see the other people interact with other people and also to be socializing we are social species humans are not individuals so the whole history of humanity based on the social phenomenon this is what is us this is what uh, what is the core of the human society because of that a lot of people who don't have this opportunity at the moment they are eager to go back and at the same time there's quite rightly a lot of people who have a lot of fears about getting back into the crowded spaces and i guess this fear will stay until the moment when either vaccine will be created or probably some drugs which will cure the virus or its symptoms at least uh, to me i think it's really important if probably we will all together try to find a solution how can we make the life of people in the concert halls for performing life for performing arts as safe as it is possible maybe there need to be some measures done in advance maybe there's some tests need to be done so i think in many ways the future of performing arts right now for the upcoming year or maybe couple of years lies in a place how can we assure the people who are coming to the concert hall that they are in the safest possible place there should be in my point of view there should be more medical researchers in that territory too of course all the main forces they are in territory of fighting with the virus and all credits to them however this is very important with the support from the government and from society we can go through that i'm i hope for it and i'm really believe in it but it needs to be effort from everyone effort from everyone in creativity in research in human spirit and in belief into the future so for us nowadays as marshall have said you know instead of being in the other places actually today i supposed to be in oslo for my last concert as a chief conductor in oslo philharmonic orchestra uh, for us to be here probably we can find even more creative energy inside ourselves we can find different angles but we need help from everyone only together we can go through this this crisis only together we can pass it and art is vital and essential part of it we hope that very soon we'll be able to give you more and more art and more and more creativity great thank you so much uh, vasily and actually you're going to provide a wonderful segue for us in talking about the importance of being together with one of our guests we're going to talk to in a while um i know that you are taking on your own career as an interviewer and you're going to be starting to interview people or you are doing we look out for that but meanwhile i'd like to hand back to my colleague lisa who's probably got somebody else to talk to over to you lisa thank you marshall so now we have our two or two of our tech masterminds coming up. That's Andrew and Ulf. And 
Um, they are both EUIO alumni, actually, um, and they've been working in the background as well as in front of the camera. In the case of Andrew, who you can see here. I hope. <laughs> yeah, so Andrew, um, you've seen perform just now with the trombone quarantine the Bruckner's uh, Locus Easter. And here you can see him back in his EYO days, um, rocking a full concert outfit, uh, handing out some brochures in front of the walking tour. Here you can see him in action with two of his other colleagues from the trombone quarantine. And he's been, he's very skilled in mastering the sound of those concert videos um, that you've seen floating around on the internet lately. Um, but I'll go back to that later. First, let's talk about Ulf, who you haven't seen in the concert video now, but he's been the person who pulled all the parts together um, to make this um, coherent concert video in the end. So that's him in his EYO days. And uh, apart from being really good at editing videos, we usually see him like that as percussionist. <laughs> that's how we know him. So both of you, tell me a bit about yourself to begin with. Where are you from? Where are you now? How was it with the orchestra? When have you been there? Um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Ulf. Um, at the moment I'm living in Munich, um, inside my four walls mainly. Um, yeah, I've been in the orchestra for quite a long time, for 10 tours, uh, 2012 to 18. Yeah, and um, as Lisa said, I now was working in the background um, to stitch all the videos together. Yeah, uh, my name is Andrew McCoy. I'm from uh, Northern Ireland originally, but I live in Dubai now. Um, I teach uh, out here and we're in lockdown here as much as everyone else is, although I'm still uh, teaching. But in the free time, um, I'm putting together little projects. We have the trombone quarantet, which a few weeks ago, I contacted uh, three other uh, trombone alumni and said, look, guys, let's put something together. And uh, yeah, we put trombone quartets together, which we've been, we've been putting out there. And Ulf and I worked on a, another little project together where we put uh, Star Wars together for um, May 4th, obviously Star Wars Day. And uh, yeah, we've been putting together these little uh, projects, um, you know, in lockdown. It's one of those things that it's really important to keep in contact um, with people when we're in lockdown and what better way than to make music together. Uh, and I was in the orchestra, not as long as Ilf. I was in from 2015 until 18. Thank you both. So, Andrew, I have a very important question for you. Why do we need sound editors? Because we put sound editors down, but one would think that when we have a lot of professional music musicians doing recordings, you could just layer one of the above the other and would, it would sound great. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, um, you know, as musicians, we're, we're not robots and we don't play super strict. Even when you give the best musicians a click track and a tempo, uh, like a, a temp track of the music underneath, people will still have their own opinions of how that RAL goes, how that you know, a cellarando goes, how that bit should be phrased. Um, and the more people you have, the more discrepancy you get. So there's a couple of things, you know, part of it is getting it all lined up so that it sounds not robotic, but that it's, it's together. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, um, very few of us or none of us are professional um, sound engineers and uh, very few or none of us have, you know, 10,000 euro uh, microphones and audio interfaces and, and have all that sort of te technical know-how. So um, part of the job is lining up all of the, uh, everyone's notes so that they're all in time. And then another thing is trying to make those uh, recordings all sound as close as possible together. So some people are recording on iPhones, some people are recording on Android phones, some people are recording on Zoom recorders, Tascam recorders. So part of it is making sure that those all sound roughly the same and then putting it all in. And if you just layer them all on top, you'll just get noise. Um, and then the next thing is mixing. So it's, it's um, balancing it so that you're hearing all the important things you need to, making sure that you've got the right balance of you know, high frequencies, low frequencies, making sure that the middle is there, any reverb that you need to add, any, you know, EQing that you need to add just to make it sound 
you know, as close to a proper recording as you can, even though it's been recorded on people's phones, which are not high-end audio devices. Um, and yeah, the, the job is basically just lining it up, making it sound like they were recorded on roughly the same device, and then trying to create something that sounds nice, essentially. Sounds like a very complicated process that you just uh, described. Um, how long have you been doing that for? I mean, I've, I've had an interest in sort of um, photography and audio and, and video for a long time and I've been doing you know, bits and pieces of photography and, uh, and video work sort of on the side as a musician. Um, you know, it's a useful thing. Musicians always need headshots. Musicians always need promo videos. You know, it's about making yourself useful. Um, and I've always had an interest. And, you know, this seemed like a perfect opportunity. Every, you know, this acapella app that everyone's been using, you know, all musicians seem to be doing some sort of remote recordings and making use of the technology, uh, which has been amazing. I mean, it, you know, if we'd had this sort of lockdown even five years ago, you know, we certainly wouldn't be having as much fun as we are now with it. And, and you know, it's an excuse to catch up with friends um, and, and do these sorts of things. Um, so yeah, it was just an extension of that and um, uh, just having fun with it and just making the most of the situation that we're, that we're all in. I think that's fantastic. Just one last question about this. How, how long, can you give me a rough time of how long it takes to actually do a recording like this with maybe the quarantine as an example? Uh, that depends how accurately we, we recorded to the click track. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it depends. It, with, the, with the quartet, it's fairly straightforward because it's four players. Usually, whoever's on the first part, um, they'll record it to a click track, and then we'll send that out to the other three players so that we can hear the phrasing, we can hear the intonation, we can hear the rhythm. Uh, and it means that we can move around the click a little bit so it's not that super robotic. Um, with a full orchestra, it takes a lot longer because you know, you're going from four tracks to 90 tracks or whatever it happens to be. Um, and sometimes, especially if there's like a, you know, a slight slowing down in the music or a bit that's traditionally people have pulled around a little bit with the tempo, you have lots of different opinions on that. And so that takes a little bit of time to line it up. I mean, with the quartet, it might take two hours, it might take four hours. With full orchestra, you know, how long's a piece of string? It could add up to maybe 10, 12 hours, depending on uh, how much work needs done, how much it needs, you know, um, EQ, you know, if there's, if there's a, you know, big discrepancies in the type of devices people have used, you might have some that have a lot of hiss in them that will take a little bit of time to get that out. So how long is a piece of string? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, thank you, Andrew. So um, Ulf, you've been working very closely with Andrew um, on getting the video part um, ready and uh, everything come together nicely. How do you do that with sound and video? How did it the both of them work together? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it in the beginning, it was quite overwhelming to have like 85 videos of players in the Out of Joy. Um, I mean, firstly, to, as Andrew said, to figure out which kind of format um, the players did record in. So you have different frames per second and uh, all that technical stuff. So I needed to unify that somehow so I can work with it faster in my program. And yeah, then, I mean, it, it, my, my like job had two sides to first do the whole concert editing. So putting all the separate videos in there um, and adding this to the program notes, which Marshall uh, provided. Uh, and the like, bigger part was the actual auto joy editing so um that was the 85 musicians or i don't know the exact number now um every one of them starting in different places actually just when they start in the auto joy so that was uh, the next step to just um figure out with the score who's entering at, in which place uh, and at which time and then to uh, line them up um yeah, personally, basically. Um, yeah, and then, as Andrew said, everyone has slightly different, yeah, feeling. Uh, so I also needed to put that into the uh, video. Um, yeah, and then think of an, a way, a logic way to put the orchestra together. So again, Marshall had some ideas to uh, send me over in the beginning. And then, yeah, from that, it was just 
try and error, having some ideas sending over and yeah. Sounds very interesting. I mean, um, I would also be interested if there were like recordings that you said, okay, I can't work with that. The person has to do a re-recording. Did that happen? Uh, well, I, I was very close to asking for some new recordings, to be fair, um, because some of the uh, formats hadn't quite uh, fit what was asked. Um, but I, yeah, I, I did some cuts here and there and um, some mirroring and other kind of stuff and um, got around it somehow. Um, and in the end, everything was kind of well hidden uh, in the whole composition, I hope. Um, but yeah, of course you have issues any, with, with any video or anything you do. Uh, it's just how to deal with it and uh, how to go around. I, well, I think the final product was fantastic and you couldn't see those little things that you <laughs> edited. Um, thank you very much, Ulf. Um, I'll hand back over to Marshall for our next guest. Lisa, thanks very much. And yes, the question, were there any re-edits? Absolutely, this is a state secret. Um, look, I also wanted to name check somebody because uh, we were, Wolf was kindly talking about the program notes and actually uh, there was so much work behind doing this program. In the end, I just thought, you know what, I need somebody I can trust with the program notes. And so I'd just like to say a big thank you to Alexa Nierschlag, who actually in like 24 hours turned around the program notes for us. And uh, so that was a great, everybody helped in a wonderful way. So I would like to uh, introduce our next guest. Um, and I'd like to again start by showing you this, this particular person has a very special um, relationship with the orchestra this year. And that relationship is that here you see a picture of the conductor Marin Allsop. Um, she was conducting the orchestra at our performance at the Davos World Economic Forum. And she is to date the only conductor who has physically in situ conducted the orchestra this year. So that's quite an achievement. Um, can I welcome then uh, Marin? Uh, so look, Marin, it's great for you to join us. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that Vasily had said earlier on, which was about if we're going to get back together, it's the importance of really being together. And, and being together actually is kind of the signature name of a huge project that you've got going, which you've done around Beethoven 9. And, you know, I thought it would be interesting. I just wanted to ask you, to let us know a little bit about what is this, what is this big project you've been doing and what's happened to it with the effects of coronavirus? Sure. Well, it's great to be with everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, wonderful um, event that you presented today. I, I watched it all from home. Um, the idea, of course, is that uh, in conjunction with this, I, I thought naively that 2020 would be um, distinctive because it's the anniversary of Beethoven, 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. Little did I know that that would be the least distinctive feature of this year, but in some ways the most appropriate feature because Beethoven really represents, I think, so many things that people are going through right now, struggle, hardship, isolation, particularly isolation as his deafness ensued and, and encroached upon him. Um, and yet through all of this, Beethoven managed to find an optimism and a belief in humanity and that together, all together, we could accomplish great things. And of course, that's the theme of his Ninth Symphony. And that's really the theme of all of his music, every piece he writes. So um, before we were um, uh, enduring this pandemic, the idea was to take um, reimagine re Beethoven's Ninth Symphony for a 21st century audience with new text, um, with interstitial music woven in between the movements, depending on the, uh, the uh, location of the performance. So the plan was to bring it uh, to 12 different venues, different organizations on six continents and connect everyone up through this. Um, and there were nine, nine new texts have been written for it, um, but all based on the same themes of tolerance unity, humanitarianism, and joy, of course. So, um, you know, nobody really wanted to let go of this. And of course, the message is more apropos today than even when we started imagining the project. 
And so we're building it now into a huge online outreach. And of course, the EUIO is a, a big participant in it. And um, I'm just very, very happy to be connected with our European partners. Uh, I think it's so important that we reach across these divides now and try to unite as one race, the human race, and see what we can do to try to enable a different future. You know, the only line that Beethoven added himself was, you know, let's, we need a different tone. And I think that's a great theme for moving forward to the future together as one. Thanks, Marin. Yeah, and I, I know you and I have had conversations with um, with Europa Nostra, who have brought forward this this idea of changing the tone, which was that line of Beethoven's. And um, all the best and huge luck with with that. Um, one question I, I happened to notice on your website when I when it says about. So I looked at about Marin Alsop on the website, and of course it says you're a conductor, but it also says conductor, mentor, innovator, leader. And I just thought, um, do you, you know, do you think this is something that musicians generally should be doing today? Can they stay to say, I'm a violinist, I'm a conductor, I'm a singer, or do you think, um, you know, actually everybody has to be broader? And, and if you'd like to talk a little bit about what those broad elements are, are for you. So that's, um, we'll be back in half an hour. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it short, Marshall, which is very difficult for me to do, as you know. But um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't think this is limited to artists or musicians. I think that we really, we really need to think, especially in this moment, about what kind of citizens of the world we want to be. And it's an opportunity for all of us to, I think, expand our horizons and reach out. Uh, mentoring is is really the smallest thing we can all do. I think at this moment, we have to look toward, I think the essence of what music brings to people, it brings comfort, it brings unity, it brings hope. Um, and it's nonpartisan. It, it's not subject to individual cultural or opinion. Um, so I think that at this moment, we need to all be ambassadors for this great art form, reach out, and try to become the citizens of the world that we've always wanted wanted to be. Thank you so thank you, uh, Marin. That's I mean a great inspiration. And I know for our orchestra, we're always thinking about what are those ways that we can become real ambassadors. Um, by the way, anybody listening in, if you've got any questions, do put your questions in the uh, the live channel, and we'll try and see if we can answer them. But for now, I'd like to hand back to Lisa and see who she's got in store for us next. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Marshall. So next up are again two EUIO alumni, Amalia and Sophie. You've already seen them perform today with the string quartet um, to show you who I'm talking about and to clarify some names. <laughs> Here you can see that we got um, Sophie on the top right on the viola and Amalie on the bottom left on the violin. Um, I hope you two are listening. Um, please introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, um, where you are at the moment and how you're doing. Okay, I will start. My name is Sophie, I'm from Amsterdam. Um, I played in the orchestra from 2014 and did eight wonderful tours. Um, with the orchestra and I'm so happy and thrilled that I'm still a little bit attached and uh, play with other alumni in this concert. Yeah, hi, my name is Amelia and I'm a Danish violinist. Um, yeah, I did two or three tours with UAO, but since then have done a lot of these extra projects that they tend to do a lot of, which I'm very, very happy to do. And I have now lived in Vienna for five years and studied and just finished my studies a week before this happened. So I'm very much officially unemployed freelancer now. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but this has been a beautiful project to do in the time of nothing else. That's true, it gives us all uh, hope, <laughs> which the topic says of this whole thing. So, um, Today's Europe Day, as we all know, and actually you, Amalia and Sophie, should be somewhere entirely different today. 
is that right? Just like last year. Yeah, we were supposed to be in Myanmar right now on one of the many outreach projects that UAO does. And we were supposed to play a huge Europe Day celebration concert today with, uh, in collaboration with musicians from there and the string quartet you were just seeing and a pianist as well from Europe. And um, yeah, as invited um, by the EU delegation there to kind of send the, the, the spirit that is EYO to Myanmar as well. And it's so, it was so wonderful last year. I hope we will be back soon when this is over. Yeah, you've been, last year, both of you have been involved in the teaching programs and also did some performances. Um, how was that? I mean, you were pairing up with the Orchestra of Myanmar, with the new children's choir and with singers from various kinds of organizations. Yeah, we were um, we were teaching this, the national string or, or national orchestra they have there in Yangon, the capital, um, and trying to do some master classes with them individually, but most importantly, showing the orchestra side of playing together, which is quite interesting to teach Western classical music in a country that is not at all Western classical and basically doesn't have a lot of this in their culture, but they were the most excited and interested and um, yeah, impressed people to, to play with and work with. They were so excited to learn from us because it doesn't, there aren't a lot of, of musicians in this country. So they were very happy to uh, collaborate with us and yeah. That's great to hear. Sounds like you had a really good time last year. <laughs> I hope you can go there again someday. Um, but for now, let's talk about what you did instead this year um, online. So um, you recorded this quartet. Was it the first time playing together, the four of you? For the four of us, it was the first time, yeah. I mean, I played with uh, Amelia last time in Myanmar as well. Um, and I think I played with Clara and in the orchestra, but for the four of us, it was the first time playing together. Was it also the first time doing an online recording for such a project? Um, yeah, well, it, it was together with the Star Wars project, also EOAO project, but um, it was the first time for me playing online. Um, so it was a little bit searching in the beginning we made a, a like a tryout recording, um, which kind of scared me. <laughs> but, uh, we only played on a click track, and then you notice that um, um, we all played in tune, but it was all very out of tune because there are a lot of different tunings and there are a lo lot of different interpretations of a beat. So you can play on the beat, or you can play on the beginning of the beat, or on the end of the beat, and so that was very, very interesting to actually um, experience. So how did you go about the process after realizing that the first attempt didn't really work? Did you then um, agree on the interpretation more or how, how did they work afterwards? So first we have a, had a really long meeting about just which tempi we wanted in the different uh, parts of the piece. Um, things that we realized we wouldn't normally even have to speak out loud in words, but we had to agree on this. And then we had a, a click track doing these different risadandi and, and accelerandi and stuff. Um, and then we, we recorded first the, first the bottom cello and then Sophie played on top of that and then another and another on top of that. So we kind of layered it. Um, so we could tune a little bit to each other and hear the, the tempi and the timing and stuff. But I think we, we all realized how much we just feel each other when we're in the same room and how important it is to just, I mean, we could have played this with closed eyes if we were together just by feeling breaths and all this that, that comes naturally normally. We had to, we had to really talk about stuff that we wouldn't have to normally and that was a very interesting process to realize and also agree on stuff that we wouldn't normally have to. Yeah I think that's the main challenge when you're not able to physically rehearse together 
you have the, the communication works differently, also works with us differently in the staff team. <laughs> so we had a question actually coming in for all the alumni. What are your plans after the lockdown? Um, well, I am realizing that auditions are coming um, more online as well. So I'm recording a lot of videos for different orchestras right now. And um, normally I would have a very full schedule of traveling and, and doing projects in each country, which is the last thing that's going to happen right now. So we'll see how much different it will be like after all this. Hopefully we'll come back to normal soon. Anyone else wanted to come in? Sophie? Well, I, I just hope that um, the orchestras will find a way to start playing again and also to invite um, the extra players, the freelance players, which I think we all are at the moment. Um, and at the meantime, I also try to uh, to find other ways. Uh, so at, um, for now, I am writing a theater play um, with musicians um, involved. And of course, it involves a viola player, which is me. <laughs> that sounds really interesting. Good luck with that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, it's kind of the same. I'm also a freelancer, so um, I'm hoping that everything opens up quite, well, quite soon and uh, within the borders. Um, as a percussion player, that might be an extra uh, difficulty because probably the big pieces are coming latest. So percussion extra players uh, will be also asked probably latest. Um, but I have the impression that, um, well, at, at least where I am now and in my, um, um, yeah, like in, in the orchestra I play in, uh, that the um, six members are quite um, aware that they would like to invite the extra players quite um, soon and uh, con yeah, constantly after that. So because they know what it is for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sort of in a fairly unique situation in that most, you know, I, I do a lot of playing out here, but most of my work is teaching, which we're still doing. We're, we're, we're doing it remotely. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I'm just looking forward to lockdown ending for all the reasons everyone else is. <laughs> yeah, I very much agree with that. <laughs> let's hope it's soon over. But for now, let's um, hear out our last guest. Um, and I hand over to Marshall Marcus again. Uh, thanks very much, Lisa. Uh, that was really interesting to hear about. And um, I'm sure we all just do hope that you guys will get your freelance dates coming back as soon as is possible. Um, my last guest is a um, very interesting person, Stephen Malinowski, who um, he's he's the inventor and, and he, he was he, he's down, I think, as a musician, inventor and software engineer, an amazing kind of combination. And he has got going this extraordinary um, thing, which is the the music animation. And I'm just thinking if my technological abilities will allow me to just show you. Um, so if I share my screen now, um, maybe you can see um, th this is obviously from the the quartet, which we just did. Um, you know, that's one of the images. I, I found it personally very interesting, Stephen, because you can see there when there's a change coming, you can really see the way you've, you've shown that one, that little orange dot in the middle. I'm sure you would know exactly which bit in the piece that is. That's part of the Andante coming up. This, by the way, is uh, just for people to see. So this is um, <clears throat> one of the animations that Stephen did um, of a Bach fugue. And with the fugues, it's a fantastic way of just seeing how they're really put together. Then he's done some really extraordinary stuff. Here is something which shows the last minute of the Rite of Spring. Um, and maybe my favorite one, um, this is a piece by Philip Glass. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit, Stephen? Show us around what this image is all about. I'll keep the image up for a second whilst you're talking. Yeah, yeah. Well, that um, that's an interesting etude uh, by Philip Glass, piano etude. And it's, um, 
it's very repetitive. Every section is repeated several times and all the sections are the same length. And I wanted to do something to show the structure of the, of the composition. And so I made it so that there's a, as you can see, the, the, the note objects are in a circle instead of being um, horizontal. Uh, the lower pitches are toward the center and the higher pitches are toward the outside. And the, um, it rotates as the, as the music plays and one cycle through a passage is one turn around the circle. And the, um, the notes light up and, and change as it, as, it, uh, as it plays. And as the, as the different uh, sections of the piece happen, the whole image transforms. Great, that's, that's really interesting. I, to me, it looked as if we'd suddenly gone into the deep ocean. And I could imagine when you get away from the light, those are the kind of creatures that you, you might, be, might be seeing. Look, take, take us through this music animation thing. You've been doing it for a number of years um, and you have this music animation machine. What brought you to this thing? Why, why did you start it? What stage are you at with it at the moment? And where are you hoping to take it? Well, it, the, the starting point was just reading scores. When I was um, in my 20s, I was studying to be a composer and performer. And part of that was learning how to read um, orchestral scores, string quartet scores, other kinds of scores. I was a pianist, so I could handle two staves. But you know, when you get to an orchestra, you have dozens of instruments potentially, and uh, it's much more complicated. And um, I had the experience of um, watching a, uh, you know, having a, a single line be very clear, but an orchestra be less clear. And I was thinking about what are the what are the perceptual challenges to that, and. One of them is that when you're watching a, a piano score or just a, a, a single instrument, all the notes are in one space, pitch space. You know, the, uh, if a note is higher, it's, it's up, if it's lower, it's down. But on an orchestral score, you have, to, you have to put many, many different pitch spaces together. And so I, I was thinking, how could, how could I make a score which was more for, uh, more designed around the human limitations of vision rather than a convenient thing for a composer. So instead of having a, a, a performer score or a, com, a composer score, I wanted to make a viewer score. And so my, my, first, my first scores were just very simple, like the, the Pasacaglia and Fugue example you gave, uh, where it's just a little block of color for every note. But um, starting about 10 years ago, I, I began experimenting with different ways of showing the notes and realized that I could express more of the structure of the music by giving different aspects of the music, different shapes, different ways of moving, different colors, um, that sort of thing. And, um, and so that's, that's what I'm in the middle of now is figuring out, it's sort of like a new language of, um, of music notation. Uh, to show the things that a composer or performer or a listener are most interested in uh, to, make it, uh, to make it simpler, to make it so that the way I think of it is uh, if a person who studied music and studied score reading like a, a, trained, comp a trained conductor has a, a very rich view of what's going on in the music and how much of that could you just give to a naive, you know, untrained listener with the proper visual tools. So that's the, that's what I'm in the middle of now. And as for what comes next, who knows? I mean, it could be a new art form. It could be um, a new teaching tool. One of the things I'm doing now is um, I'm working with a, a guy who's a, a cochlear implant researcher who is using my scores to train um, cochlear implant users how to hear again. So they, they will show music and they will say, because normally when you hear a sound, there's no visual counterpart for it. So you don't know, am I hearing the right thing? Um, but with, with my uh, graphical scores, a cochlear implant user can verify that they're hearing what they think they're hearing and, and train their ears uh, a new way. So, you know, it's a completely, um, completely open field. That's fascinating. That's, that's really interesting stuff. Actually, it makes me immediately want to ask Vasily a question, which is, you know, Vasily, you are 
you're the one who has the score in front of you. You're used to seeing all of this stuff there. I was just thinking, as I saw that that page of the end of the Rite of Spring, um, you know, what what do you think when you see that? Do you see any interesting possibilities for rehearsing? Clearly, you have that kind of thing in your head all the time. But seeing it written in that way, does that does that give you any ideas? Well, it is actually quite similar to the music score to what is written vertically in the Red of Spring. It's not that colorful on, on the print and the music, but uh, the imagination is great. I mean, I'm always, whenever I'm rehearsing or performing with orchestras, I'm always trying to give something more than just notes. Notes are abstract symbols. More important is what we what we feel, what we bring behind the notes. And in that sense, I think expansion of our vision into the graphic, into the colors, into the images, it's always great. Uh, I have done several projects when music was uh, simultaneously done together with images, with VJ artists, with a sand artist, with uh, other people. And I think this combination and connection between the visual and audible it's very important so to me uh, there's a lot of pieces of music where i really see those visual pictures of different objects of different architecture of diff different happenings and the music obviously can provoke our minds to have those images i'm you know totally both hands up for steven to continue maybe with uh, some other pieces of music to create even more images Great. Thank you, Vasily. That's really interesting. And thank you so much, Stephen. It's been really, I mean, for me, I must say, um, I was looking at the, this quartet, which we put into the program, and it's it's quite an ask for, especially a non-musical audience, to listen 15 minutes to that quartet. And that was when I looked around and I saw your animation, and I just thought, there's something really, really interesting there. Um, look, the rest of our guests now, I just wanted to kind of throw our floor open a bit to everybody. One of the things with the orchestra that we've really found very interesting, especially in the office for the office team, is how this unbelievably radically different period that we're living through that nobody imagined, you know, even months ago could be possible. If you've seen it in a film, we would have said yes, but it will never happen. Well, it has. And I, I, what I'm noticing is the way, as well as being a huge threat to the way that we exist, it's also been this incredible opportunity. And I'm already seeing myself, you know, massive ways in which our work and the way we work is changing and ways which we'll stay with. And I want to ask all of you, actually, are you finding that? Are you finding that um, your work is changing and you're having new ways of going, which actually will carry on? Or, you, or are you just waiting to get back to where you were? Uh, Andrew, you go for it. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I said earlier, you know, a, a lot of my work is teaching. And so overnight, you know, we went from from teaching a full a full day to then doing that remotely and doing that online, which has been, you know, such a, a change for everyone. But what I think has been even more amazing is, you know, the way that how quickly musicians picked up on, you know, I mentioned earlier this acapella app and how quickly people picked up on this idea of being able to, record remotely, be able to connect with people. I mean, I said earlier with um, a project that Ulf and I worked on uh, with 52 other musicians and we put together a mini orchestra and it was an amazing opportunity to be able to do that and to produce something at the end of it, but also that idea of keeping in contact. And people got really emotional in seeing it all put together because although we recorded it in isolation, when you watch the final product and you see everyone's faces up there, people have these, you know, people get very sort of nostalgic and reminiscent about the last time that we did all play together. And, you know, I think the way that people have embraced the technology um, is just amazing. And I think I said earlier, you know, five years ago, uh, even less, I, I don't think we would be doing it as well as we are doing it uh, now. Thanks, that's great. And by the way, if you were to by any chance put a link into our chat uh, for that um, 4th of May, uh, special, then uh, we could put that into the YouTube live chat and people can see that because I looked at that and I was I was blown away by it actually. I was blown away principally, but well, not principally, but one of the things was how much you were all just unbelievably enjoying yourself. Uh, that's the UI of spirit though, I know. Um, so if you want to do that, we'll, we'll happily do a little bit of advertising for you on that so people can see that, that, that uh, YouTube. Um, Ulf, have you got anything to add to, to that? Um yeah well i mean i do see it 
with me just quite drastically because I changed from playing percussion and symphony to video editing right now. Um, and um, learning all of, about that in a few weeks time actually, um, so, which Andrew partly forced me into. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, so for me it's a learning process and um, I do see myself doing that maybe more often also in the future, but um, still I prefer sitting in an orchestra and um, making music instead of uh, just having that in front of my screen. Um, but yeah. That's, that's interesting. Thanks. I'm going to ask uh, Sophia the same question in a second. But first of all, I'd just like to put through a question to Vasily that came through from uh, Marie-Hélène Cusack is asking you, Vasily, how difficult was it for you to conduct without seeing anybody? It's not easy. Uh, and uh, you imagine uh, the orchestra in front of yourself. Uh, you imagine all the people playing it. Uh, but uh, you know, I think we all conductors, we have this music sounding in our minds. And to us, it's just a process how to transcribe it through our hands. So you hear this piece in your mind and you try to translate it into the musicians. Then usually you do have a response from the orchestra, which is this or that close to what you have in mind. But uh, when you don't, it's not an easy. And especially talking about Ravel, uh, about Bolero, it's about 15 minutes of the same measure, the same rhythm, and for conductor to keep the momentum going, to make this piece uh, from literally from the very tender, very soft sound of the drum into the final climax, uh, also with your gesticulation, with your hand, it's not easy. Uh, I, again, I prefer to have it on stage with, uh, with orchestra, but I try to do my best. You can decide how good or how bad it was. Well, it was pretty amazing when I think about this. Literally, you conducted 15 minutes in silence. It was a kind of John Cage 4 minutes 33 special. It was uh, not just 15 minutes in silence, but it was three times by 15 minutes because we had a three different takes for the for the for Ulf for better video editing. Uh, so to me, uh, there was. Uh, Interesting experience, but you know, we are at the time when we're trying to discover all the new and different stuffs. You know, I have a tomato growing in my greenhouse at the moment. Very good. And uh, we should say at this moment, actually, huge thanks to Anton, our uh, EYO musician who did the uh, video with his lens cap um, company. And that was amazing. They were the ones that had this brilliant idea of. Um, taking you, the players around the gallery of a, a concert hall and then putting them on the stage. So well done for that and justified the um, many hours of work. If you're around, Anton, listening, this is a cloud out for you. Um, so Sophie, again, for you, um, I know you're waiting to get back to some, some stuff, but uh, what have you, if anything, has this excited you to do anything you're going to do different in the, in the future or, or you just want to get back to how things work? Well, I think it works both ways um, because at the moment we are forced to think creative ways to bring uh, music to our audiences. So um, and um, so we have to think outside the box um, and create stages um, outside the concert hall. So this could be the start of uh, something new in this. Um, um, I hope we can we can do it both ways that we also develop this more and better so we can reach out to audiences who don't go to the music stage normally but they also like to go back to the normal stage and and play normal things again um, with real people um, it, imagine when i got the, i got the, the recording with clara playing the cello part and i was playing karaoke with her and I got so excited to play chamber music again for the first time in a month. Um, so um, I hope it goes both ways that we can develop this more and better and um, and also go back to the to normal life and play real music with real people. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Amalie, what do you think? Where are you? What are you going next? What are you going to be doing? 
Well, I, I'm seeing a lot of potential and I'm always thinking that this is the perfect time for something, perfect time for something like this to happen because our technology is so good and we can do Skype meetings or Zoom or Facebook or whatever, which one we, we prefer. Um, I do hope that this is going to be some extra help for us, especially for musicians, it's not that this is the way to do it. But I, I think there's a lot of potential for Sometimes you don't have enough rehearsal time together, but you can, I guess we can start using this kind of meetings more in advance of, of meeting all at once. Um, and yeah, I think we got a little bit less afraid of these face-to-face uh, -face, uh, computer calls, which has always been there, but we kind of used it more now, but I do prefer uh, live music and I'm in the beginning there was so much uh, so many digital digital concerts happening and people were playing from home but I'm seeing also more and more uh, new concepts and ideas of playing outside playing in the courts of a uh, of, of a building what is that called courtyard and uh, playing for the open windows and stuff and I, I really like these kind of ideas and I think we see a lot of creative ideas right now which is kind of exciting. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and a couple of things. Um, Andrew is reminding me exactly why it is that the uh, that his Star Wars video is so extraordinary. There's one reason, and that is it's full of European Union Youth Orchestra alumni, and I really think that's that's part of the the thing. So um, I think you've got that Star Wars posted in the comments. Uh, Andrew is very modestly saying it wasn't just him. There were others doing that. Ulf was involved. I think Ulf did the video and Andrew did the audio in that. Um, if you're interested in any more of Stephen's uh, music animations, I hope we can get, there's a load of contact, a load of, um, uh, of links we've got. I hope those could go into the chat as well. Beethoven 9, Debussy, he's, he's done all of it. I, I think he must have done most of the, the Western European canon, as far as I can see. Um, look, uh, all the guests, I just want to say a huge thank you. Thank you, Vasily, Marin, our EU alumni, Stephen. It's been really interesting to hear from you. And um, now I'd like to say a handover to Lisa, who's going to help say goodbye to this program, I think. We, we're doing more of these. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you. So for me, also a huge thank you to everyone um, being involved in this. I think this was a very nice and interesting session. Um, and I would love to see more of those. Um, for anyone who enjoyed watching this and also enjoyed watching the concert before, it's going to be available on our YouTube channel. So you just use the same link that we had before for the live concert and you can watch it whenever you want to if you miss the beginning or the middle part or whatever. Um, so now it's just for me to say goodbye as well and um, I hope we can meet in person someday at a concert again, a physical live concert. Um, and yeah, have a lovely evening or morning or midday wherever you are. Thank you. Great. If we all unmute, we can all wave at the same, t same time. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. I like how he jumped up right at the end. I didn't see that. <laughs>